How many can recall 9-11? You know exactly where you're at and what you were doing. A friend of mine knew exactly where he was at and what was going on. He was in surgery. So he was in the hospital and he was unconscious because he had anesthesia to make him unconscious for his surgery. And then there were a few complications with that and so he was out of touch with everything that was happening for the next three days. Now can you imagine when he woke up how the world had changed? We saw it all unfold. He did not. He had missed the biggest crisis perhaps in my lifetime because I'm not old enough to go back to Pearl Harbor. <laughs> yeah. Imagine missing everything and then trying to be caught up. I want to talk about the man who missed Easter this morning. The man who missed Easter. Uh, and I want to draw some life lessons from this one particular man. It says, here's my text this morning. It says, now Thomas, that's his name. He's one of the 12 disciples. He is called Didymus. Uh, if you're a Rush follower, or you were, uh, you know that they called the, each people, uh, his followers, ditto heads. Ditto? You know, when we would go, ditto, you're just like him, ditto. Didymus means a twin, twin. So uh, he is one of the 12. He's, he's called a twin. It may be that he had a twin brother, but it says he was called. It doesn't say he was a twin. It could be that he looked like Peter or James or John, or maybe he looked like Jesus. And he said to him, just called him Thomas the twin. You know, kind of a flattery term. I don't know. All I know is he's identified as Thomas the twin. Now, most of us identify him in a different way. We identify him as Thomas the doubter, the doubter. Well, he was, one, he was not with the disciples when Jesus came in his resurrected body to the upper room. He missed it. He missed it. It's not the only thing he missed. The last time he saw Jesus, and he was one of the twelves, was on Monday, Thursday. Now, Monday, Thursday is the Thursday before Good Friday. He had celebrated the Passover with Jesus, and then they went out into the garden, and there the, Jesus was praying. And he's one of those guys that fell asleep while Jesus was praying. I know what it's like. Some of you fall asleep while I'm preaching. <laughs> they, he'd fallen asleep while he was praying, and uh, later they were interrupted, disturbed from their sleep because the guard had come to take Jesus, and... and Peter jumps out of his sleep, he pulls out a sword, whacks off the high priest's servant's ear, and, and Jesus heals him, tells him, put it. he saw all that, he was there for all of that. But soon as he was kissed by Judas, and they took Jesus away, Thomas fled. All the disciples scattered. You know what happens that night. Peter denies Jesus three times even though he pledged his loyalty to him. He missed that because he didn't even stick around with Peter. He's gone. Where did he go? I don't know, but he's gone. He missed Good Friday. He wasn't there for the trials. He wasn't there when, when Barabbas was chosen over Jesus to be freed. He wasn't there. He wasn't there on the Via Dolorosa going up through the streets of Jerusalem all the way down and up, in the, uh, up through the valley uh, onto Mount Golgotha. He wasn't there when they nailed him to the cross. He wasn't there. He was missing in action. He wasn't there when Jesus said the seven sayings on the cross and finally says, It is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And he died. He wasn't there. He wasn't there when Nicodemus and, and Joseph of Arimathea got rights to the body and took and laid him in the tomb. He wasn't there. He missed it. Totally missed it. He wasn't there on that Sunday morning. It was still dark. And Mary and the other Mary planned to go to the sepulcher and, and anoint the body of Jesus. On the way there, 
he wasn't with them. He, he didn't know that they were wondering how are we going to move the stone. He wasn't there. He missed it. When they got there, something unusual had happened. There had been an earthquake and as the angel of God landed and shook the earth. And the soldiers there that were guarding it were so afraid of them, they couldn't speak and they could not move. And the angel went over and rolled the stone away. And Jesus exited alive from the dead. He wasn't there. He wasn't there. He was missing. He missed it. He wasn't there when the Marys got there and, and found the tomb empty and saw the angel, and the angel said, he is not here, for he is risen from the dead. Come see the place where he lay. Thomas had missed it. He had missed it. She went back and told Peter and John, and they darted out as soon as they found him. They're running and running, and Peter's a slug. That's kind of like me. I am not a fast runner. So John zips there, and he gets there first. He stops, and he looks inside. Finally, Peter arrives. You know why he stopped and looked, looked inside, didn't go in? To go into tomb would make him unclean. Unclean. From his Jewish heritage, he's waiting. I, I, I'm not sure I want to go. And Peter, you know Peter. Act first, think later, you know. He zooms right in, and he looks around, and he sees, it's a, as the women had said, it's empty. There's no one there. John then goes in, looks, he sees just the linen laying there. Thomas missed it. The disciples come out, and they leave and go back, but Mary, she, was, she ran along behind them. She's there, and she lingers, and she's crying, and, and, and she supposes that it's a gardener. And she says, where have you taken my Lord? And he says, Mary. And immediately she recognizes the voice and says, Jesus. She's the first to see the resurrected Jesus Christ, Mary. She runs and tells the disciples, oh my goodness, isn't this great? Two of the disciples are on the road to Emmaus, and they are so downcast, they're, they're, they're so burdened, they're, 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 their hearts are broken, they're so heavy, and, and all of a sudden, a third man appears, walks in, and, and he's kind of disguised, and I don't know how he's disguised, maybe he has a hood over his head, you know, and he's just kind of looking down to the ground, and they don't recognize it, but it's the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior. And he says, hey, why are you guys so downcast? What's, he said, where have you been? Don't you know what has just transpired these last three days? That, that the Lord, the Messiah, the man that we had hoped that would be the Messiah and deliver us, the Jews have crucified and killed him. And then he started to explain from the whole Old Testament, from the law through the prophets, how the Messiah must first suffer before he enters into glory. It's getting late afternoon. They stop at a place. Jesus goes in. They insist that they have a meal with Jesus. And Jesus uh, reaches and breaks the bread, and immediately they recognize who he is. What do you suppose they saw as they broke the bread? But the nail prints in his hand. Jesus resurrected. But Thomas missed it. Thomas missed it. That evening, the disciples are gathered in the upper room. Oh, but Thomas, Thomas is not there. Where is he? I do not know where Thomas is. He's not there. The 11 disciples are gathered. Judas has already gone out and hung himself. And, and, and so there's 11, but they're still called the 12 because it's a title for the group. And the 12 are gathered there, but Thomas is missing. Judas is missing. There's only 10. And suddenly, Jesus appears with the door shut. He just appears in their midst. And he says, peace unto you. And then he shows him his hands and his side. And immediately they know this is 
the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, resurrected from the dead. What the women had said, what the angels have said, is all true. It's all true. It's all true. Thomas missed it. Thomas missed it. You know, we were not there either. You know that? We weren't there. I, I wasn't there. You weren't there. My, we're not even sure which tomb in the Jerusalem area is the tomb that they put Jesus in, right? They've got traditions that maybe one or two of them might be it, but we weren't there. So if you weren't there, how, how was Thomas and how are we to believe if we weren't there? That's the question before us this morning. We missed it. Kind of like missing 9-11. We missed it. We missed the resurrection. We missed the original Easter Sunday. The second lesson that I want to learn here is that not only can we miss Easter, oh boy, and you can miss Easter even if you're here for Easter, because Easter is not about bunnies and eggs, and it's not about uh, uh, chocolates, and it, it's not even about going to church. Easter is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and knowing him and the power of his resurrection. So if you missed it, how, how are you going to experience it? Well, you need to believe eyewitness testimony. So the other disciples told Thomas when they saw him, we have seen the Lord. Isn't that great? I got a question for you. How many of you have ever seen Alexander the Great? I don't see any hands going up. How many of you have seen Julius Caesar? Don't see any hands going up. How many have seen Shakespeare? Nobody read them. <laughs> Didn't understand them. <laughs> Man. I doubt that there's anyone who questions that they live that they died. Why? Well, it's in the history books. Oh, it is written. Who's it written by? Eyewitnesses. I believe the report of eyewitnesses. I do it all the time. I get on an airplane. I take my seat. Stewardess says, oh yeah, the pilot is in the, in the captain's chamber. I've never seen him. But she told me that. She said, oh yeah, I saw him go in. In fact, I served him a cup of coffee be just before he went in. Good, I want him to alert while we fly. The eyewitness told me, and I believe it, especially when the plane takes off. I know that there's a pilot in there. It's not taking off on its own. Listen, most of what we believe and know has come from an eyewitness who has recorded it for us. It's true. We accept it on the authority of the eyewitness. Now, we want the eyewitness to be a credible authority. We do. If it's not a credible authority, we don't want to believe it. We don't want to believe lies. Eyewitness testimony is the way Thomas is going to have to believe. Eyewitness testimony is how you and I have to believe. We have to believe. There's other testimony besides these 12, or the 10 actually. It's the prophetic testimony. 700 years before Jesus Christ, Isaiah in a vision is recording as if he were at the scene what is happening? I'm just going to jump to the end of the passage here. The passage is profound. It says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. When Jesus was suffering, down, uh, dying on the cross, the Lord was bruising his son, and God was pleased. Whoa, that blew my mind when I first read that. Why was God so pleased to bruise his son? Because of what goes on in the rest of this verse. Jesus was taking our sin. God was pouring out the wrath that we deserve on him. He's bruising his son 
so that we can go free. Isn't that amazing? Watch what he says. He has put him to grief. He says, when you, Lord, make his soul an offering for sin. Whoa. When Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had made his soul an offering for our sins. He was paying the debt that we owe. God turned his, his back on him because God is a purer eyes than to look upon the iniquity of us all. And there Jesus, the infinite Son of God, in just a matter of moments, pays in full the debt that would take us all eternity to pay because he is an infinite person and he can die in my place. His soul was made an offering for sin. He said, he shall see his seed. What? Jesus had no physical children, so what's he talking about? Spiritual seed. Those who would believe in him, he will see them. What he's saying is, even though he dies, yet he's going to live. You will prolong his days. You're going to raise him from the dead, and he's going to live forever. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Not only is there the testimony of the prophet long before Christ came, there's a testimony of Jesus himself. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hand of, many, uh, at the, hand of the elders, the chief priests, and the, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. I put two other passages that say the same thing. Jesus was predicting that this is what is going to happen. This is his testimony. I'm going to die for your sins. I'm going to be buried. And on the third day, I'm going to be raised from the dead. Whew. There's still other testimonies. There's the testimony of the preaching of the apostles. The apostles were preaching. God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of this fact. In Acts chapter 2, he's preaching to the crowd in Jerusalem. There's thousands there. And he says, we are witnesses, you and I both. All you in Jerusalem, you're witnesses. What happened? They can't produce the body. The tomb was empty. Jesus is alive. I love this passage, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul is talking about the resurrection. He says, Jesus first appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. All witnesses. The most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Whoa, there were plenty of eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus raised from the dead. Very well attested. Then there's the testimony of changed lives. This is profound. Jesus had these apparently bubbling idiots for disciples. He tells them straight out, I'm going to be killed. Three days later, I'm going to raise from the dead. And whew, it went right over them. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. He picks these guys to change the world. Every time Peter seems to open his mouth, he sticks his foot in it. One time, Jesus had to say to Peter, Satan, get thee behind me. What? One of them betrays him because Satan filled his heart. Judas. He picks them. Listen, how do you take this ragtag group of fishermen and, and other misfits and change the world? Here's what happened. He took a guy like Saul. Saul was out persecuting the church. He hated the church. He hated Christians. He's rounding them up, incarcerating them. And what he did, he was on his way to Damascus. He was going to gather the Christians, incarcerate them, going to punish them for, for this heresy that Jesus was raised from the dead. He was out after them. Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. This is a conversion experience of the Apostle Paul. From Saul to Paul. What changes a man's life? 
the resurrected Christ. How do you take these 12 apostles and change the world? Well, their lives were changed totally because they saw the resurrected Christ. Why through the ages have there been so many who will die for their faith, who once opposed it, because of the resurrected Christ. There's still more testimony. I just don't have time to explain it. But if you have any doubts, you need to read The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was an investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. His wife became a Christian, and he was upset over that, so he decided that he was going to disprove Christianity and Jesus Christ. And so he set out, and he was going to go contact all the, the greatest minds and, and scientists and, and theologians to find out exactly how he, could, how he could disprove this. And in the process, he realized that all the investigative evidence and support and uh, modern scientific research and technology all lent to the idea, the truth, that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. And he became a Christian. If that's not enough for you, you need to read this one, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. There's volume one and volume two. There is so much evidence of eyewitness testimony to the fact that Jesus himself raised himself from the dead. They gave, these 12 apostles, they gave to Thomas who was missing they gave the eyewitness testimony. We have seen the Lord. So how do you respond when somebody gives you eyewitness testimony? How do you respond? Well, you know how he responded? With doubt. I kind of doubt that. Come on, you're pulling a fast one on me. You think I'm gullible? Come on. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marked in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into the side where they thrust the spear in Jesus, he said, unless I do that, I will not believe. I want empirical evidence that I can see. I got to see it for myself. Hey, listen. If he would appear before me like he did to you, I would believe. And I know people today say, well, yeah, if Jesus would appear before me, I would believe. Listen, the next time Jesus appears before you, you're going to believe. For is it appointed unto man once to die? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You know what happens on that day? You're going to believe. You're going to believe. He missed it, and he would not believe. He missed it. Fourth, uh, fourth lesson from the resurrection, Easter Sunday. The man who missed Easter. You can still experience Easter blessings even though you weren't there on Easter morning. That's a great point. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them this time. Now, I don't know why he's there. Maybe he's there to tell them, hey, it's been a week and I haven't seen him. What's going on here, you guys? You're still trying to pull my... I don't know why he's joined them, but he's there. And it said, though the doors were locked, nobody's getting in or out, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Thomas needed that reassurance, right? <laughs> Maybe he's thinking, man, I wonder if he's angry at me because I didn't believe. <laughs> and Jesus then says to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hand. Reach your hand, put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. You can still experience Easter blessing if you stop doubting and just believe.
that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. He calls Jesus God. Jesus does not rebuke him. When angels are worshipped by men, they immediately rebuke you. Don't worship anyone but God. Jesus is God who has come in the flesh for the purpose to go to the cross and die for our sins, to be buried, and if it satisfied the justice of God, to be raised from the dead so that he might impart to us eternal life. And, Je- and, and Thomas here says, Lord, my God. He makes Jesus his God. Wow. Then Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have experienced me, you have physically t- touched me and handled me, you believe. I right hear. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Thomas, you wouldn't believe eyewitness report. You had to have this tangible thing. But I'm telling you right now, more blessed are those who accept the eyewitness testimony and don't have to have the empirical verification. They believe the word of God. They believe the testimony of God. That's how you still get in on Easter blessing. You believe the eyewitness report from the scriptures about Jesus Christ. See, you must, this is, this is lesson five that I'm getting from this story. You must believe the eyewitness testimony to live. You have to. You have to. The next verse says this, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. He said, the whole book of John, all right? He's been recording different miraculous signs. He said, but there were a lot more that aren't. But hey, listen, these that I've written in the book as eyewitness testimony, what are these miracles that they were eyewitness testimony to? Well, changing water to wine in John chapter 2. What else? Healing the nobleman's son in John chapter 4. Well, what else? Healing the, the paralytic, the guy who was paralyzed from his birth. And, and, and Jesus said, do you want to get well? I love this question. And the answer would be, yeah, I want to get well. But he said, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. What? You answered incorrectly. And Jesus says, take up your mat and walk. Sometimes we're pursuing the wrong things. Jesus wanted to heal him. All he wanted to do was get back in the water. He was so used to the lifestyle he had. He didn't know what lifestyle he could have with Jesus. Wow, powerful stuff. Another one of the miracles was the feeding of the 5,000. So a little boy sack lunch fed all these people, 5,000 men. I'm supposing there's some women and children there, maybe 10,000, 15, 20,000. And he feeds them all, and he collects from that one little sack lunch. They're all fed to the full, the text says. And he collects 12 baskets full of it, Oh my goodness. Jesus was walking on the water. Another sign. Jesus did that the disciples saw. They're eyewitnesses. And they've recorded it for us to believe. Peter gets out on the water and walks to Jesus because he believes in Jesus. He recognizes his voice and he said, bid me to come out on the water. And he's walking on the water. And then the wind starts blowing. and, and, And Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus and he begins to sink. He's an eyewitness testimony. He prays this real short prayer. Lord, help. Doesn't get much shorter than that, does it? And she just re- pulled him up and they got back into the boat. Listen. They were eyewitnesses. They experienced, they recorded, they written it down for us so that we know the power of this resurrected Lord. The man that was born blind, he spit on the ground and he mixed it with his the dirt with his spit and made mud and stuck it in the guy's eyes. 
my eye doctor did that to me, I'd be smacking that guy and say, what in the world are you doing to me? He said, go wash, come back seeing, and he did. Listen, these disciples were eyewitnesses. They wrote it down for you and me. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man, dead for four days, came out of the tomb. He says, unwrap him. Unwrap him. Let him go. Then there's Easter Sunday. Jesus was resurrected from the dead. He said, these are written down. There's this all of a sudden Jesus appearing in the room and saying, hey, touch and feel me. These are miracles. He said, these were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. Whoa. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You believe the written testimony of the eyewitnesses, and when you believe that, that is faith that comes from the word of God, and when we believe, we are saved. Amen? Amen. In 1 John 5.10, it says this. I took the New Living Translation because it just lays it out so plain. All who believe in the Son of God know in their heart that this testimony is true. The Reformers called that the inner witness of the Spirit. When you're a believer, God sends His Spirit, His Spirit, His spirit bears witness with your spirit. You know in your heart the Bible testimony is true. You know it in your heart and you believe it. Doesn't matter what science says, doesn't matter what psychology says, doesn't matter what medicine says, doesn't matter. You go down any discipline, any science, you know in your heart by the witness of the Holy Spirit, in your heart, you know that the Bible is true. Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Now, the second half of this says, those who don't believe this are actually calling God a liar. If you don't believe, there is no neutral ground here. None. None whatsoever. You either believe and you know deep down inside the testimony is true, or you don't believe and you're calling God a liar. There's no neutral ground. You can't say, well, I haven't made up my mind yet. No, you've already made up your mind if you don't believe. You've chosen not to believe. You call God a liar because they do not believe what God has, here it is, testified to about his son, that he's raised him from the dead. I will recap the, 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 the little lessons that I pulled out of this passage today. Okay? The first lesson is this. You can, meet, you can miss Easter. I mean, Thomas did. You can miss it too. I mean, you come to church, but you can miss it. If you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've missed Easter because it's all about that. He's risen from the dead to be your Lord and Savior. You need to believe the eyewitness testimony. You need to get into the Word. And if you still have doubt, you need to explore even further. You need to explore. You need to get those books. You need evidence that demands a verdict. You you, you need to look and, and find and discover this is all important. It's of eternal value. You have to overcome your doubts and come to faith. You've got to believe. You may still experience Easter blessing even though you weren't there and you've been to many Easter services, but you can still experience it if you accept Christ as your Savior and make Him the Lord of your life. To do that, you must believe the scriptural testimony. Wow. Here's the point that I'm trying to get across today. You need to stop doubting and start believing. Uh, That's not original with me. That's what Jesus said to Thomas. (laughs) Stop doubting. Start believing. Watch. 
Many of you have done that. I accepted Christ as an eight-year-old boy. And I got a statement up here that I'm going to read that affirms my faith. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who voluntarily died for my sins and was raised, or raised himself from the dead to give me eternal life. Amen. That's what Peter said when he made the great confession of faith. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what Martha said to Jesus before Lazarus was raised from the dead. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. That's what Thomas is saying, my Lord and my God. This is the heart. Now, if you believe that, I want you to say that with me, line by line, out loud, okay? And if you, if you believe that, if you don't believe it, just keep your mouth shut and let's just listen to everybody else. But I want you to say it with me right now. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. Wait, wait, time out. Some of you are just barely saying that. I want you to say it like you believe it. You sang earlier like you believed it. All right, let's start all over. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who voluntarily died for my sins and raised himself from the dead to give me eternal life. Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. While your heads are bowed, maybe that was a reaffirmation of your faith. You've accepted Christ some time ago, and you say, I have. That was a reaffirmation of my faith. Would you, would you raise your hand and just say, Pastor, I was just reaffirming my faith. I was saying the things that, that I already believe and know. For some of you, that was the first time you've ever made such a confession with your mouth, and you say, Pastor Dennis, that was the first time I ever confessed Christ like that. Would you raise your hand? Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We believe the eyewitness testimony recorded in the scriptures that Jesus is raised from the dead. He is the living Son of God who paid the price for our sins, who raised himself to give us eternal life. We believe. Give us reassurance in our hearts that our sins are forgiven, that we are on our way to heaven. Change us from the inside out so that we have that spirit bearing witness with our spirit that the Bible and the testimony is true. Use that word to change us. So like these apostles who couldn't do anything right, once empowered by the Spirit of God, you change them radically so that they would change the world. Change us too, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please rise with us. As Christ did, up from the grave, he rose. And if you haven't seen, there actually is a movie case for Christ that's amazing.